Tom Wiley, he's been our regional geologist since 1989. He is now officially an Oregon fossil. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, worked with the USGS from 1983 to 1989. He's got a Bachelor of Science from Humboldt University and also a Master's from Stanford University. And we thank a lot of you, Tom. Uh, we really appreciate your, your ability to communicate. And uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. I can tell you, it's, this <coughs> is phase two of several phases to come. There's already other groups that are asking for a uh, you Dogami guys to come and keep helping us understand what's going on. So let's give a warm welcome to our regional geologist, Tom Wiley. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's nice to be down in Grants Pass and not have to drive to Portland today. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, but I still live over in Colonial Valley and have a house up in Portland where I spend my weeks. Um, well, what I'm going to do today is build a little bit on, on what I talked about last time. Last time I kind of gave you a quick overview of, of geology and the state and the different mineral resources in the state. Today I'm going to review real quickly uh, some aspects of mining, particularly small mining operations, and then talk a little bit about uh, the... Uh, types of geology that we have in the area, and then I'll go on to um, what we're looking at, taking the techniques we've learned to use to uh, assess mineral uh, potential on state properties. Whenever the state sells, trades, or buys a property, they, look, they attempt to figure out what the value is, and we make the first cut at that. And I'm going to try and apply that in a broad sense to Josephine County. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Then a little bit on technology transfer, the kinds of things that GAMI is doing now that we can bring to the county. Um, a little bit of history on the field office, and then I'll close. So I've got a lot of slides. Lot of slides yeah. This is, uh, you know, mineral assessment is about as boring a topic as you can get in. You guys are going to see maps that in the old days would have taken months to prepare. But now with the computer, you can prepare them fairly fast. So um, it may look like I'm ripping through stuff, but there's a lot of information here. Last time we had this meeting, the gold was at $1,600 an ounce. And these little pieces were worth quite a bit more than they are now, at $400,000. Those are about two and a half inches across. And, um, Came out of the Greenback mine. Four hundred thousand. So I just told you about this stuff. Um, when we get to the technology and information transfer, we look at, at areas in geology, mining and historical records, uh, mine land permitting and reclamation, and a bunch of other ways you can use light. The mining realities are there's still a lot of valuable minerals in there. But it's expensive to develop and run a mine. The mining is intensely regulated. Reclamation is required. You can't just go out and make a mess. You have to put up enough money that at the end of the process it can be cleaned up even if you go broke in the process. Working mines produce the highest resource values per acre out in the world. They also produce a lot of jobs that pay well and support other jobs. Now this is a nugget. You would think California's bungalow would be all played out. But this nugget was found in 1977 with a metal detector. It weighs 156 ounces. In Josephine County, we've had a couple big nuggets. 17 pounds, about $300,000 today. Came out with the Collins nugget out of uh, Althouse Creek. And a 15 pound nugget from Sucker Creek about 260,000 bucks today. This is the largest nugget that's still around from Oregon. This is the Armstrong nugget. It's over in Baker City on display in the, in the uh, bank there. And that's worth seeing if you go over there. Go to U.S. Bank and look for gold is So the mining industry in almost all commodities is cyclical. Gold's a really good example. This chart, the red, shows the uh, inflation-adjusted price of gold 
So today's price of 1600 is still something less than the peak of inflation adjusted 2500 back in the 80s. And then this black line is the, uh, the actual price in dollars at the time. You can see when the gold, we were on the gold standard and the price was fixed down here around 35 bucks. These fluctuations go from 35 bucks in 1970, 850 in 1980, $300 in 2001, $1,800 a few years ago and $1,300 today. So if you're going to do a mine, you have to anticipate that your prices are going to fluctuate, and you have to deal with that in your planning. Another part of this is there, there are things going on all the time in the economy. So there are new plays for different types of materials, like natural gas. Between fracking and directional drilling, the, uh, the amount of natural gas has shot up, and the price has gone down. There are also new uses that increase demand. So we're going to talk a little bit about tellurium today. Tellurium is a, a metal that's used now to make solar panels out of cadmium telluride. Sometimes the, uh, the sources, the main sources for mineral are played out or they're put off limits politically. Um, recently China decided to embargo rare earth um, uh, exports. Wow. And so the price of rare earths shot way up. And then areas with a vibrant mining industry have to deal with these kinds of cycles. <clears throat> now just in general, the large companies are able to seek out the large deposits and they can deal with lower grades of those deposits. Small companies work with smaller deposits, but they generally require higher grades to make it. There are a few of these big deposits in Josephine County, including the Almeda mine. That's the picture here, down on the road. The chances are it wouldn't be accessed, accessed from the rogue side anymore. But if people worked on the Alameda, they'd come in from the back side. And of course, most of you in the room know there are a lot of small companies in the So there are cost factors that make or break the small mines. And a lot of us, a lot of you guys have, have small mines, and that's a big part of the county's mining economy. The, the, the predictability of the geometry and the grade of the ore material is important. If you know what you've got and you've got a lot of it, you can plan, you can spend money to be able to deal with it. If you minimize the handling of waste rock, you save money. If the ore body composition is inexpensive to process, it doesn't have anything that's going to result in acid mine drainage or something like that. It's free milling quartz, you're in good shape. Other environmentally benign materials, like if you have a lot of calcite in your mine, it's going to buffer any tendency towards acid. So sound planning and preparation are important all the way through the permitting, mine plan, and the reclamation plan. The size and orientation of the pay zone is important because you want to be able to have an efficient mine. If the veins are as wide as the tunnel and have little wall rock, you're in better shape because then you're not moving wall rock that's costing you money that doesn't have any gold. Now some places the wall rock will carry some value and that helps reduce the cost of the mine. There's a minimum tunnel width for the equipment that's available and that's kind of what you're stuck with. So here's an ore that's inexpensive to process. It's largely free milling quartz. This one's out of the uh, 16 to 1 mine in California. We've got a lot of ores here that are similar, in, particularly in the Greenback district. And the buffering here is with uh, calcite. You get a mechanical or gravity separation of the product, so it's an inexpensive process. You don't have to roast this stuff. You don't have to, you don't have to truck it or train it someplace else to have it smelted. If you do have those types of materials, you can often concentrate your, um, your ore here and then ship just the concentrates rather than shipping all the ore. And of course if you have to go to flotation um, where you have the gold and the sulfides or associated with telluride minerals, um, that's a more expensive process. Now what we, what we look at in terms of 
of uh, finding different kinds of prospects is what's called the play in the oil patch. And they go through a list of things that they have to have to find an oil field. So they have to have organic rich source rocks, permeable reservoir rocks, a migration path so the oil can move to the reservoir, a sealer cap on the reservoir so the oil doesn't leak out, and a trap that catches the oil in the reservoir. You can make the same kind of list of what you need to have to have a decent little mine. You can see here, with this, this is a map of Oregon, in the back here is a little light, and the distribution of, of uh, gold mines is shown with these dots. And you can see how many there are. There's the outline of Josephine County. You can see how many of these mines are in Josephine County. So this is the place to look to develop a flood. So we want to find an area where there's been sufficient extension to form vein system, quartz vein system, sufficient silica in the host rocks to produce the quartz that you need to make the quartz vein. And the mapping is showing this, the geologic mapping that we're making shows that where we have chert or quartzite in the area to begin with, we're more likely to develop quartz vein systems. And sufficient gold in the host rocks and, or younger intrusions to be mobilized by with the quartz and deposited in these veins. So the ideal underground mine around here would have an ore body with well-defined geometry, wider, wider than available equipment, benign or buffering gang materials, free milling product, ability to place some of the tailings underground, simultaneous mining and reclamation so that, your, so that your equipment is not running empty. And if you can do all of the above, you end up with a mine that's easier to permit in the first place. Most of the small mines deviate one way or another from the ideal mine. <coughs> Uh, the ore bodies are often smaller and inconsistent, so they have to deal with wall rock. The ore contains minerals like sulfides uh, that can acidify the water, and often it'll contain poisons like lead, antimony, mercury, or arsenic. So you have to deal with all those things, and it costs a little bit more. Now, last time I talked a little bit about this Canadian Standard 43101, and I'm not talking about it because it's an Oregon standard. Though Gammy doesn't require this, the state of Oregon doesn't require it. What I'm talking about, the reason I'm talking about this is if you guys want to describe your mind to somebody that's interested, they like to see it described in the terms that this standard requires. Um, they have requirements for how the samples have been analyzed. Uh, they want to know, you know, how was the geologist license that, that, that uh, proofread the report? Things like that make it a lot easier to talk to somebody that's thinking about listing a mine on a Spokane or Vancouver type exchange. So if you're trying to sell your mine or, or promote a mine, this is something you should read. It's a widely accepted industry standard. And when you're working in your mines, if you want to keep meaningful notes, use a GPS to locate your sample. Focus on repeatability and use of standards in any tests that you get. Maintain your original data sets. Don't just average what you got, maintain the original. And consider doing channel and, and chip samples across whatever you think the ore body is in addition to just reporting the highest grade. So we all know that the mineral exploration business is big business. It is affected by the price fluctuations, it's affected a lot by community support, and it brings high paying jobs to the So an example is the Benton mine. Up through April 15, 1942, when the government shut it down, it produced $500,000 in gold at 35 an ounce. That's $20 million at the current price. Mm -hmm. It's got more than two miles of underground workings, and for a while, in 1941, it was the largest payroll in the county. Some, there's some like related industries that we don't think about. Fire Mountain Gems has a lot to do with geology. They're our biggest employer right now. One of the largest firms up in Sweet Home, Oregon, is White's Metal Detectors. So there's, there are industry opportunities associated with mining and geology, in addition to the ones that you think of work. 
So now I'll talk about the geology a little bit. The geology of, of uh, southwest Oregon and northern California is, is forms what's called the Klamath Mountains. And this word terrains refers to little bits and pieces of, of land and, and geology that have been brought here by the conveyor belt of, of the of plate tectonics. These things move with the ocean floor and eventually they slam into the edge of North America or into the core of the Klamath Mountains down here. And so they've just formed all these sort of parentheses-shaped bands that wrap around that core. Then younger rocks are deposited on top of them and, and intruded up from beneath them. But these are the building blocks that give us the minerals that we have here in Josephine County. So when you get down to the scale of Josephine County, it's kind of this you know, these projectors always show things a little different than they look on the screen, but here's the outline of the county, and it's just about the color of a lot of these geologic units. But what you can see in general is there's a trend, a north-northeast trend, to all these belts in the geology, and that's because these are these terrains that are wrapped around the core of the Klamath Mountain. That's just another view. We're right here. This is the Grants Pass Pluton, and so we have four or five or six terrain between, uh, between the coast and Medford. So now I get into this, this mineral scoping report or mineral assessment for Josephine County. We borrowed these techniques from the, from the state techniques as I mentioned, mentioned earlier for state land exchange, purchase or sale. I, we base it on known resources so it has to be something we have a record of. And then we look at the, how the resource distribution is related to the geology and what we can learn from the geologic setting about where there might be more or less potential for additional resources. And typically we do a review of all the minerals followed by specific... Well, typically we do an over, a review of all the minerals. And then I'm, but here I'm just going to talk about gold and tellurium because you don't want to hear about them more. But I will read you a list of them. So Josephine County has, in our database, about 1,600 mines and prospects shown in the dots here. And you can already see how some of these, some of these concentrations of dots line up with the geology. Aggregate mines, sand and gravel, and, and crushed rock are shown in green. Industrial minerals are shown in blue. And the metals are shown in gold. See again, the, the north-northwest trends that parallel the trends in the geology. So here's what we've got. Antimony, arsenic, asbestos, barium, beryllium, bismuth, cement, chromium, clay, cobalt. This includes limestone, these cement materials, and marble, the marble mountain. Copper, diamond, gems, gold, iridium, iron, lead, limestone, manganese, mercury, molybdenum, natural gas, maybe. There's some people looking into whether or not you can make natural gas out of something like serpentine. Nickel, palladium, platinum, rhenium, rhodium, rhodochrosite, rhodonite, sand and gravel, silica, silver, soapstone, stone crushed, dimension stone, talc, tellurium, thallium, tin, tungsten, uranium, vanadium, and zinc. <coughs> so it's quite a list. Obviously, we don't have big mines producing all of these, but we have mines or prospects where these were, have been found. We don't have a lot in the way of energy resources. We don't have a lot of hope for energy resources. Um, there's a possibility we could have natural gas, gas in the Dothan Formation. It's the equivalent of the Franciscan Formation in California. There have been a couple tiny fields produced there. There's this other idea about making methane out of serpentine that's kind of interesting. And I didn't give it a lot of credence until I went on a, I went a field trip here. And one of the guys that was kind of traveling incognito and not saying too much about himself, didn't remember that we went to school at Stanford together. <laughs> and I knew he went to work for Exxon. So Exxon was up here looking at, sending this guy on a field trip to look at these, uh, these serpentines. So if they want to understand it, there's probably a reason. Uh, we don't have coal or coal good methane like the coast. We have <coughs> little mentions of uranium and thorium, but probably not a mine. 
Tellurium's an interesting thing. I'll talk quite a bit more about that later. Geothermal, we only have a few warm wells. So you might find geothermal areas where it's more efficient to put in a ground source heat pump, but you're not going to make electricity. Metals, we're going to look at three, three main groups, the precious metals, the base metals, and strategic metals. This is statewide distribution of metals. And they're mainly concentrated in areas that have older rocks, like the northeast and us here in the southwest. Base metal and silver production from 1905 to 1964. This line is a million dollars. So it got up there for a while. Um, but generally it's been pretty low. Often as a um, byproduct of gold mining, um, there was a mine in southern Douglas County that produced in the early 90s. The silver wheat mine. In copper, we have 176 mines in prospect. I'm just going to rip through these because I've got a lot of stuff. Lead, 30. Here, through here. Again, Grand Pass that's right here. Cave Junction down here. Zinc, 30 mines in prospect. Because copper, lead, and zinc often occur together, a lot of these are showing the same mine. Silver, 184 mines in prospect. Of course, most of these are in concert with a gold mine. Chromium. Chromium occurs as chromite, and it's associated with the ultramatic rocks, the serpentines, and peridotite. From 1917 to 58, we produced 118,000 tons of chromite, a value of six or almost $7 million in, in uh, <laughs> anyway, a value of about $7 million. And uh, today, that'd be about $23 million at 200 bucks a ton. Len Ramp, who was the, the uh, regional geologist here before I got here, did a lot of work on chromite. And he suggested that there are some, some chromite mines where they might have some fairly large reserves. He thought he was able to map out large holes that, uh, that contain the chromite. And the chromite pods are typically very hard to predict what's going on with them, where they're going to be, just finding where they are. But these may be, a, may be some bigger reserves. Nickel, we have nickel laterites associated with the weathering of the uh, peridotites and serpentine type rocks. Cobalt, same story. I'll talk about gold in a little more detail and show you how we do these resource assessments a, a, a little bit more rigorously. Uh, these are the old Oregon Exchange uh, gold pieces. This was a $10 gold piece. Uh, 1849 and the $5 gold piece. Uh, most of these were made out of, out of uh, gold brought up from California. And the Oregon Exchange Company, these initials up here, KMTAWRCS, were Kilborn, Magruder, Taylor, Abernathy, Wilson, Rector, Camel. <laughs> so that was the company. And apparently the production of these, although you know not sanctioned by the federal government, uh, did result in a much more stable price for gold. And these guys, because they didn't want to be accused of doing anything untoward, this, this was nearly 24 karat gold. And so most of these coins disappeared and were melted down so that they could be alloyed to make a, a more resistant coin. Mm -hmm. And they say that some of it, like, you can see this one's kind of rounded off. They say that's happening because it was in the pocket with harder coins and just, uh, Scratching it up. So the statewide distribution of gold deposits is again in the northeast and down here with us in the southwest. This shows the, the gold production from 1877 to 1965. It's peak here in 1940. Wow, that's an interesting plot. Um, the decline here is due to this issuance order L203 from 1942. And right about here in 1934, they increased the official price, and you can see our production went way up because we could get more for the gold, so more mines were productive. 
Josephine County 364 produced about $325 million worth, Jackson about 265. For the last 50 years, we don't know for sure, but if we just made 750 ounces per year, that's still $50 million that we added to our economy. Here's the countywide distribution of gold prospects. It shows some over in Jackson as well. You can see how they just kind of stop when you get east of Bear Creek. And when you get west, uh, well, pretty much the county line over here, this is what's considered the Franciscan system. So we have 633 mines and prospects. You see how they line up with the geology. If the green dots are the placer mines, the red dots are associated with massive sulfides, and the black dots are the other load mines. So there are places here where you'll have a bunch of load mines, and then the creeks go out across this ground that apparently doesn't contain much gold in the ground. Well, you guys will probably tell me different later, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, mainly, mainly placer deposits along the rivers get through these, these voids, but they're still there. I haven't heard there was a placer down in here someplace west of town a couple miles. Well, um, it isn't on our map. So I took those sites and I, and I assigned them high potential. And any ground within 500 meters of those mine sites, I, I assigned high potential. So you end up that way with about 198 square miles. It's actually a little less than that because there are a fair number of duplicates in this database. <coughs> But just doing it in, that, in those rough terms, you end up with a couple hundred miles of prospective ground. Then I just kind of eyeball the concentrations of gold mines and assign those areas moderate potential. You can see that these, these match up pretty well with uh, some of the mining districts. Here's the Greenback. Uh, this would be Grants Pass and Lower Applegate, Walnut, Tilma, Josephine Creek. The, uh, those moderate, those areas of moderate potential, about 560 square miles. The green areas still have some potential. You can see a few lines, 1,380 square miles. And the blue areas, there are just a couple lines out in here, and they've already been accounted for because we, we gave them a 500 meter circle in the high, high potential area. So there's all three. The high potential, the moderate potential, the low potential, and the close to no potential. And tellurium is something that's um, come up fairly recently, and, and it's got an interesting story, the way, we're, the way we've started looking at it. And, and it occurs with gold, so mine for it might pay for itself. It's reported from a bunch of mines around here, and it's likely more widespread than we know because the tellurites look like fool's gold, they look like pyrite. This one, the silvery one in here, is called Calavera. Named for Calaveras County, California. <clears throat> so why the sudden interest? It's mainly because of this new use, it's cal having the tellurite solar cell. It's been added to the list of strategic metal, and it adds value now to any mine where it occurs. And since it wasn't that valuable in the past, it may be present on the tailings piles and in the dome. So the story with this is interesting because in the early 1990s, Mike Cope brought in some concentrates from the Jewett for, for Frank Lagke and I to look at. And Frank pulled out the reports and found the mention of tellurium. So Mike's been interested in that ever since, and he kind of pushes us to understand tellurium. And since that's supposed to be our job, we, we do a little bit. Um, then the Cadmium tell Telluride solar film thing went into production. They produced seven gigawatts of these, these Cadmium Telluride, Telluride solar panels. So in 2012, we applied for a USGS grant to study the distribution here and, and figure out which of these <coughs> terrains, which of these geologic models is, re is more likely to be responsible for where the tellurium is. And just lately, um, some, some Oregon State geologists, uh, John, Dr. John Dillis up there, and uh, some of his students have, have confirmed the presence of tellurium in, in those old uh, Jewett mine concentrates. So we don't have many localities in the database. There's about a dozen. But I, we've, we've just recently gotten all our mineral reports scanned, and we ran optical character recognition on the scans. And you can just
tell the thing to do it and go to lunch and come back and it's done. So, um, so we, we did that and then searched for the mineral names related to tellurium and there's probably another couple dozen references in our reports to tellurium. Mike's probably found most of these by, by looking at the records, but uh, this now gives us a handy tool to look for anything in our report because they're all, they're all essentially a word document. How are we doing on time? Um, before or after two, probably. Okay. So, so I talked a little bit about technology transfer. What Dogami can bring to the taxpayers and the local government. We have publications, of course, and that's our main way of getting our information out. And we have digital data, like these, uh, like these databases I've been referring to all through this. And then what, what the employees really bring is the expertise, you know, to talk to somebody for a couple minutes and realize, hey, they need this, and then tell them what they need. And we can save you guys, often we can save people a lot of time not trying to chase down the wrong thing, not buy the wrong thing. Um, in terms of mine planning and permitting, our reclamationists have years of experience looking at mines. And, and they've studied you know, the mining techniques as well as the, as well as the reclamation techniques. And often, the mining technique that's the least expensive for the, for the uh, miner will work out to be the, the mining technique that is, leads to the best reclamation. You know, I was talking earlier about you know, not running your equipment empty that kind of thing. If they can help come up with a plan that makes the mine more efficient, you're more likely to still be in business when we want to reclaim the mine. And they're familiar with the regulatory practices and concerns of other agencies. So they can, you know, as you work through a mine plan with our guys, they can help you uh, determine whether or not the mine plan is apt to meet the specifications of other, other permitting <coughs> they do this you know, all through the history of mining at your site. And of course, they, we require a bond in case a miner goes broke. Nobody's ever heard of a miner that went broke. <coughs> Miners often do more than is required on these reclamation <coughs> efforts. This year we gave a, um, or, yeah, earlier this year we gave an award to Copeland for one of their mining sites down on the Applegate. And just a couple of years ago, there was an award to one of the mines on the uh, on Josephine Creek. The Williams Creek, there's a over by Williams Creek near the near the uh, highway. There's an old sand and gravel mine, and it was interesting to me that when OWIP first started their program to purchase properties that were most beneficial to endangered. Um, habitat, endangered fish, and coho, one of the first places they bought was this little gravel mine that had been reclaimed. So sometimes gravel mining is not the environmental problem that it might be. And if we reclaim them right, they can be a really good habitat. And, and I know a few years ago there was a book. Mm -hmm. See if I know how to undo that. A few years ago, there was, there was some exploration done down in the wild and scenic part of the Rogue River. And I don't think you can recognize that that parcel was mined today, and I'll bet most of you didn't even notice it happened. So I'll talk a little bit about the field office. Uh, David was mentioning like to know a little bit more about the field office. We, we were established with Aaron Grant Pass in 37 with the Organic Act. Um, Governor Martin was, was big locally here and pushed the establishment of a Department of Geology and Mineral Industries to help with uh, jobs during the, during the Depression. So the department administered the Grub Stake Act and we did, the, the office here started out doing assays and then it's developed a, a, a geologic library. <coughs> so here's a list of the geologists that have, that have been in the office. Uh, there have been four of us since 1955, and Lynn Ramp stopped about the same time that I started. So between the two of us, we go back about 
60 years. Um, and that's real handy, you know, because Lynn tells me about all these things you see out in the field and passes on the knowledge he got in his 30-some years as a geologist. And Norm Peterson, um, likewise, helped me with a bunch of mapping and passed on the information to Frank Ladke, who worked here for quite a while, and, and myself. And if you keep rolling it along that way, you don't lose a lot of this information. The community's been, been involved more than most communities are involved with most agencies. Uh, ben Bones donated land and buildings for a field office and residence up on Upper River Road back in the 60s. We co-located the office with uh, Forestry and Fish and Wildlife in, in 1989. Um, <coughs> we maintain both the Geologic Library and the Rocky Mural Collection that's now in the courthouse. So what, what does the field office do for, for a community and for the counties in Southwest Oregon? We emphasize local issues, we understand the local issues, and we try and, and uh, look at the science in ways that will help with those issues. We transfer scientific information to the local community. So some of these things I've been showing with LIDAR and, and uh, information about earthquakes and that kind of stuff. Um, you get to the point where you can recognize the rocks and products from many of the mines around here. You understand the geologic literature, and including the stuff that's, that's kind of hard to find. If someone comes in and they have a the place they're worried about, sometimes we can pull out something they wouldn't find at all. We do a lot of training and coordinating with other geologists working in the area, so that, and that kind of works two ways. We, we, we give them the geologic information that we have, so they have a good head start. And then we uh, we try to get them to put out a publication or some kind of report that's the kind of thing we will use and the communities will use. And so you don't end up with a geologist that shows up from the University of Alaska and just uh, goes away. You actually get his data incorporated into the mapping all those kinds of things. It's, it makes a big difference in the types of information in the local area gets. And then when I was working down here, one of the most rewarding things was to get a, a lot of geologists working on things that I would never have time to do, so that we just dramatically increased our production of geologic maps and geologic So we talk, everybody talked a little bit here at the start of the meeting about, about uh, what's still in the ground. Well, this piece came out of the Jamestown mine down in California in the 1990s. There's a guy standing next to the square. They found this just a few tens of feet from the old working. You know? I mean, they were really close. And we have a story that's very similar here. How many of you guys know the Miller brothers over at the horseshoe? So, so John Miller and his brother Juan, whose name I've forgotten. Um, in the 30s, they go back into the horseshoe mine and they and they set off a blast and they pull out all the rock and there's nothing there and they go and they have their careers and they do different things and they finally retire and they say, okay, let's go back to the mine. So they go back into the horseshoe. And they start, they're getting ready for the next blast. And to get ready for the next blast, they got to pry all the loose stuff up. And when they pry the loose stuff up, they find a wheelbarrow full of gold-laced rock. Wow. So, so a little bit of this is, is we don't want the county to do what the Millers did. We want them to find the resources now instead of 60 years from now. Remember when I started, I showed you those two and a half inch diameter biscuits of gold? So here's a cleanup for two weeks. Oh, they didn't show up. Here, here's a cleanup for two weeks at, at the Bunker Hill mine. These are not two and a half inches across. I, had the, I thought I had the little picture here of the other four, and there's like two of these are the same as those other four. So this is a massive amount of gold here. These guys produced 5,000 ounces in 1926. That'd be six and a half million dollars today. 
One piece so large it broke a man's leg and fell off the wall. <laughs> so, I'll leave you, I'll leave you with that to think about. It. That's it. Just give me my hand. I'm Jim Frick from uh, Southern Oregon Resource Alliance. Where are you, Jim? Hey, there you go. Why don't you say something? We like you. Well, <laughs> something. No. Uh, what are you guys doing over at SOAR anyway? Well, Southern Oregon Resource Alliance is concerned with timber mining and agriculture, and that was the foundation of our county. And so we're working on more education to our community, and we're working with uh, an idea of setting up some subcommittees now on timber separated from mining, separated from agriculture, that we can actually go into the schools and start teaching the kids about, you know, that if it wasn't mined or grown, that they're probably not using it today. You know, what a concept. And so that's, that's the newest thing that we want to do. Since we've been losing so much in the way of FFA in our community, um, We've been going away from timber mining and agriculture. We'd like to bring it back into uh, the main focus of our county. And that's why we've been working so diligently with the commissioners and had their ear. It was nice that Keith, who was involved with my uh, timber committee, understands that. He's been looking at those resource issues. Simon's been doing the same thing with the, the mining. That's why you're putting these things together. And we appreciate everything that these committees are doing. I'd just like to continue to see this uh, continue to work. Um, we, we have a, a major hemorrhaging in this county right now, as you know, with public safety. And a lot of these dollars and stuff that can be retrieved from implementation, we feel the mining and the, the timber can uh, help restore our public safety, and that's what we're looking at, too. Thanks, Dan. Um, we have Mr. Mike Cope. He's uh, working with various groups. Uh, I like Mike because he's a history guy, and he digs. And the only problem with Mike is that once you get into teaching, you better have some time. <laughs> because he can cover more ground. I, I wish he was a professor in a class where we could go listen to him lecture. But Mike, could you take two or three minutes to tell us kind of some of the projects you're working on, please? Well, since Tom brought it up, uh, in 1993 is when I rediscovered uh, our gold tellurites we have in our county. But in 93, it did have an importance uh, and now it does because it's energy and it's a semiconductor material. And over the years, there was a couple of investigations towards the subject. Now. There was an investigation in 1927. They thought it was tin, and I believe it's, it was polarity. Um, currently, I have got Oregon State uh, working with me on a, on a project on some uh, actual analyzing of, of materials for various mines. Um, and it, it's a subject that needs to be looked at because it's brand new. And if we base everything around gold, it ain't going to happen because of the environmentalists. But Tellurium last year was put on the critical mineral list, and Walden uh, just signed on that, on the Strategic Critical Mineral Act. So that will speed up our permitting process for critical and strategic minerals. Not it. Hey Mike, thanks for all your digging and hard work in Tenassa. So, if you knew all the years that some of these guys have dug and scratched and gone to Salem and gone all over to try to keep our community in a positive po uh, posture. And uh, you know, I, I even went up, uh, Wally Hicks sent us up to the Natural Resource Committee at, at the house. And one of our best contributors to the report was Sheriff Gil Gilberson. He was explaining that if we shut down all these logging roads and mining roads, that they can't get out there and rescue us guys when we're hunting and fishing or messing around. So it's all important that we work together, and I appreciate that, the, the kindness and the attitude of the people I've been working with so much. I've had the privilege, because of being the chair of the committee, to work with a lot of different people at the state level and all across the region. And when you begin to see the LIDAR picture of what the potentials are, and I've talked to several guys about not just mining economy, but mining technology. Building mining equipment right here in Tosby County and export worldwide. I just come back from Africa. They need 
mining equipment, mining technology, and the geologists. They need, you wouldn't believe the amount of mining that's over here in West Africa. I just sit in one place and could see maybe 10 miles, and in all directions, as far as you can see, was tailing piles. It was done with a pick and a little wooden pan. And, and uh, we know in Brazil and Mongolia, a lot of places in the world, I'll tell you, China is rushing into those places with mining technology. Well, Josephine County, hello. We've got I-5, we've got the Redwood Highway, we've got a railroad, we've got an airport, we've got Tom, and, and now we've got Andre, we've got all these guys on our side. Why wouldn't we launch deeper into educating kids, possibly? We've been having long conversations about possibly a mining school somewhere back in Southern Oregon. Our field office. And I say, we can get back in the game. Now you saw the, all the dots on the map. We have a history. We're sitting right in mining country. Got a lot of guys around there that's built stuff. I've been out to some many of your mines. I appreciate Commissioner Harry. He's got the truck with me and I've drug him all over. He looked at more rocks than any commissioner ought to. But wouldn't it be fun to get a group of educators, legislators, and experts together and try to figure out, you know, what do we have and how can we move into the future with best use machinery, best use techniques, modern discovery for lazy geologists that don't want to go out there anymore? Why not? Do you want to go out there? We just don't want to hike through the poison. Up. No more. So, so having said that, there's there's a growing thing like uh, Jim Frick was talking about educate our kids. I know, and I'll say this with all humility and, and urgency. I met with some of the top leaders in Africa and in Dubai, Arabia. They love to send their children to America to be educated because we treat their kids nice. We send them back home not messed up. And when your kids go to other countries, so a lot of the national leaders in, in the Middle East and Africa, South America, we got a value here that we may not be tapping into completely. So there's a lot of ways to look at these issues, and, and we, we're learning this as we're walking along together. So having said that, um, Anybody else has a QA? You got a question? <coughs> David I want to know if that LIDAR, if we can get some type of map, mapping from that. We can make a lot of different kinds of maps from the LIDAR. What do you think about it? Or oh, out in my area. <laughs> I think it was collected along the application. So if it's out there, it's just a matter of if it's not, if it's not on the publicly accessible, ready for download thing, yet it will be eventually. Okay. So you mean like an ancient old channel that no one know it's up there? You're going to go find it? Tom, are you ever going to get the seven and a half minute map of Grand Pass Quadrangle done, or is that still in the making? Or it's it still on the list. Or? We've done the field work, and we've done most of the study. Just have to get time to get it done. It would be very helpful. Any any other Most questions? Of that map back is back in the morning. Quiet one. Hey, Woodhead, ask a question. I just think this is great. I'm looking forward to seeing more activity in the county, yeah. and uh, looking forward to the come and picking up because of the efforts of you guys. Yeah. So you've been a. Uh, in the hotel and hospitality business, and you also fly that big balloon around town and scare all the cats and dogs and horses off. <laughs> we talked at length one time about the uh, tourist potential of our history and our geography. If someone come to town and floated the river and went out in the gold pen or maybe at the county uh, mining museum or whatever, or right here in the middle of town, maybe someone will start a mining museum right down by the bridge. I mean, there's tourism. Possibilities here. Potential is, is, is there. We just need to tap into it. Don't you think we're all believing ourselves here in Josephine County that we've got something on? We're special. We're special. Do you hear that? Mr. Woodhead said we're special. Mr. Paul. Oh. 
You tell us a little about your position in the government, and could you give us some hard realities about what it might take to get a fill office back here? Because I know you're you know the dollar and cents and the protocol. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the economy real quick. You know, we have two main pieces. We have the mining regulation side, which Carrie Lynch handled out of the Albany office. Uh, and then we have the geologic survey and services part, which Tom is part of, where we do our mapping and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. The reality for uh, natural resource agencies in Oregon, um, for the last 20, 30 years or whatever, has been pretty dismal in that our, our slice of what the state actually contributes towards our budgets has been shrinking dramatically. And so when we actually close the um, the uh, Grants Pass office, about three by any ago, I think it was, um, it was because we had a 30% cut in our general fund. So it was a fairly dramatic shrinking of our resources. We've actually done fairly well as an agency because we've been very opportunistic in terms of chasing things like LIDAR, applying new science, and going after, um, I don't want to call it project money. So we go after special grants, special projects, money from the federal government, um, the LIDAR grant brought, brought in a lot of federal money, um, and we use that to continue to fund a lot of our activities, some of the geology, um, a lot of the flood mapping, um, you know, landslide mapping, earthquake work, and those kinds of things. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a challenging world we live in because uh, over 60% of our income now is um, one time out type of projects. You know, we just completed the tsunami in Napoli on the coast. You know, that was a five year project. It's done, and there's been some continuing money, but at a very uh, much lower uh, source of the revenue. So, so that, that's a challenge that we have. Yeah, right. um, and I'm hoping that you know, because I think we're we've gone through a fairly long cycle, you know, for 10, 10, 12 years here, of pretty tough budgets for everybody. And so I'm kind of opti op um, optimistic that uh, things are going to start to improve, and maybe it's a pendulum swing. The state will look to invest more. But you know, the challenge we have as a state agency is we can't lobby. Um, you know, we can put forward our, bu our little budget packages and stuff and hope to get uh, some traction with that to the legislature. But a lot of what we get is very dependent on communities and people of Oregon wanting it and advocating for it and pushing for it. So if, so if some of our people here in southwestern Oregon were to go to the purse string guys, the people that, in Salem, the, the oversight committee, the budget guys, and said, you know, we, if you'll give us that fill office back, we'll generate more tax money and sit up there and just something like that. We need to, we need to lobby for our own interests. I'm not, I'm not sure what the, the deal would look like, but yeah. you know, the reality is if you were to do it, we would love to have the have office back open here. We'd well, like I'm, to, I'm we, sure our commissioners... We'd love to redo our improve our bigger city office here if we have one person there. You know, we really would like to do more, um, and especially when we start talking about minerals, you know, that, that's our history. You know, we formed around that, and we do very little of it now, and almost none of it's funded, so um, you know, that's our challenge. Well, I would imagine, though, in our county situation that we might be working closely with you guys at some point in the future to try to figure out how we can fund and fill up. So appreciate what you're doing, coming all the way down and being with us. He's got, I had lunch with these guys, he's got a lot of interesting insights that we might consider in the future. So, at, um, thinking of the man who's down here, and we have a couple of things that have come forward as proposals for mining on county lands. Um, ORS 192.660 gives us the opportunity to meet the executive session on this subject. And so we've invited Dogami to participate. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to try to move the ball forward on a couple of uh, proposals. And so that's what we're meeting on. It's not open to the public, and um, it's not important to know why. We have to go into executive session on this. It's provided for under state law. So, um, but all of this stuff before a decision is made on any subject, that has to be made in public. We're not making a decision. We're just generating, um, gathering information. Yeah, Did you just say it's not important to know why? Not at this point. You will in the future. If we choose to do anything, You'll have to know. I can't do anything at this point. All I can do is gather information. So, so, yeah. so you're saying that you have a couple proposals for mining operations on county lands. We're trying to refine the process with how we determine what's the best step forward on addressing proposals. 
That, I thought you were a little bit more clarity. Yeah, yeah. right, right. Because you know, I've had my application in since 2008. I'm still waiting. That was a county line. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're aware of that. Well, the more, the more, the more, the Not exactly so. a simple process. Thanks, Mr. Cole, I'd like to ask Tom um, what he thinks about the importance of having a, a laboratory established here to do uh, mineral research on polarium and, and the relationships of the gold tellurites to start modeling further these deposits uh, so we can understand them and be able to uh, to share the information with Dogami and other facilities like Oregon State, but along to help assist the local miners and, and other people. Do you think that would be a good to have a laboratory here locally? Since Dogami had the last one? Yeah, it's been a while since we had our how, how many of you guys are sending your samples out of state for assay? Well there's a couple. Um, it, it turns out that, that uh, there aren't too many labs around, and depending on the kind of data you need, um, you have to pick, you know, an ex one lab or the other. An inexpensive lab that could process a lot of samples that was local would certainly be um, helpful to all the miners and prospectors. Um, the, the, the challenge for a lab is the certification that uh, things like this Canadian uh, standard that the folks that are writing and, and reviewing the reports for uh, mines that want to uh, fund themselves through stock offerings on the Vancouver or Spokane exchanges, um, that's, that level of, of laboratory creation is, would be more expensive, but um, I know there's a lot of options with a lab, and really the driving force is the need to get some good data, and there's always that need. Yeah. Thanks.